Hi, I'm Dan Bauer and welcome to CBA Office Hours. This is a series where Patrick Kern and I talk about contemporary issues and statistical techniques used in the behavioral health and social sciences. Today what I'm going to do is continue our series on the linear regression model. In the last episode I introduced the linear regression model largely in conceptual terms, talking about what are we trying to do in the linear regression model, what are the parameters of the linear regression model, how do we interpret those parameters of the linear regression model, and today what I'm going to do is say, well, how do we get our estimates of those parameters from the linear regression models? So when we run our software program, whatever program that might be, SAS or SPSS or Stata or R, and we obtain a regression line, we either see that visually superimposed on a scatter plot or we obtain estimates uh, from running a procedure, what, where do those estimates come from? What's inside of that black box that generates that regression line? Um, and so we're going to talk about estimation today, and in particular we're going to talk about ordinary least squares estimation. And we're not going to go too far down, uh, the, down into the mathematical details of ordinary least squares, but, but I do want to give you a, a good conceptual sense of what ordinary least squares regression is doing and why we like ordinary least squares as an estimator, and it is the, the dominant estimator, the default estimator for linear regression analyses in general. All right, so just to start off with, let's do just a, a little bit of review of where we left off last time. Is last time I used a hypothetical example where we were looking at the relationship between experience, that's going to be our predictor variable x, uh, and performance on some tasks. Performance will be our outcome variable y, and we said that there, there likely is some kind of roughly linear relationship between experience and performance, and so what we would like to do is characterize that relationship, right? And that's what linear regression is all about. Now we can't know someone's performance exactly based on their experience. Uh, the performance is a random variable, there's a stochastic element, there are other predictors of performance that are not included in this model that would also influence someone's, someone's performance. There is just the inherent uniqueness of human beings, each individual being somewhat different from everyone else. And so we can't get an exact functional relationship between experience and performance, but we can say how the average level of performance or the expected level of performance changes as a function of experience, and that's what we're going to characterize by a straight line. And so we say the expected value of y, expected level of performance, is a linear function of x, beta naught plus beta 1 x. Beta naught is our intercept, beta 1 is our slope. And as we talked about last time, beta naught is wherever x is 0, that's your expected value of y, right? So beta naught is that value right there. So wherever this regression line crosses the y-axis where x is 0, that's our beta naught. And then our beta 1, right, beta 1 is the expected change in y, per one unit change in x. So we get a one unit change in x, we get a beta one unit change in y. It's the rise over run, or the, the slope parameter, right? So that's our beta one, and then we also talked about how, in fact, there really is kind of a third parameter in the regression model, is that if we talk about the observed values of y, those are gonna be equal to the expected values, or beta naught plus beta one x, plus that random element. Right? So that's our residual epsilon, that's that piece that we cannot explain. Right? So that each individual doesn't fall exactly on that line, but their data points are dispersed around the line, and we characterize that dispersion around the line with an additional parameter. The variance of those epsilons is equal to sigma squared. So our, the variance in performance at any given level of experience is characterized by this third parameter, sigma squared, and that's the variance of those residuals. So what we're going to talk about today is how do we obtain the best possible estimates, right? Is these are population values, beta naught and beta 1. That's what characterizes the relationship in the population. But in practice, we typically don't have access to the entire population. Typically, we only have a small uh, subset of that population as sample, right? And hopefully that sample is randomly drawn from the population, but may maybe not. It might simply be a representative subsample or sample of the population. All right, so given a sample, how do we obtain the best possible estimates beta, uh, for beta naught and beta 1? All right, so I'm going to simplify things just a little bit and say we're only interested in a few observations. So our sample is rather small, and that's going to help me to kind of illustrate some of the concepts here. So we have our x variable, and we have our y variable, and let's say we just have these four data points right here. 
Right? So those are our four data points. And what we want to do is get the linear regression for these four data points. Now, now how do we do that? Well, we could you know, try to figure out what is the line of best fit. And you know, if I just sort of draw something on, maybe, maybe that is kind of the best line of fit for this particular data. Yeah. And indeed, when, when Galton, Sir Francis Galton, first came up with the regression model, that's how he started that as he said, all right, here's a set of data, and I'm just gonna draw a line on, and this is the line that I think best characterizes this particular data set, all right? So now the problem, of course, is the line that I just drew might not actually be the best line. In fact, you kind of look at it and say, well, you know, that's a really big difference here, and these differences are all small, so why, why not predict that one a little bit better? And so we could say, well, all right, you know, maybe that's not the best line. I'm just gonna erase that, and I'm gonna try again. Right? And so maybe a better line would be that one. I don't know, right? It, it looks perhaps a little better, but maybe not. You know, what is the best objective criterion by which to draw this line so that you, know, you and I don't get different estimates for what this regression line ought to be? All right, so we want to get our estimates for beta naught and beta one that are gonna somehow you know, reach some kind of objective criterion that everybody agrees makes sense. All right, so in this sample, we're not going to have access to these population parameters. So we're not going to talk about beta naught and beta one right now. Instead, we're going to talk about in our sample, what are we going to have? All right, so in our sample, we're going to say we've got our sample estimate for beta naught is going to be B0. That's our sample intercept. And our sample slope is going to be B1. And those are going to generate the sample predicted values Y hat. And then our observed values are going to be equal to them to B0 plus B1x plus the sample residual E. Right? So, so now we're going to be talking about sample values. So when we talk about the estimated values, it's going to be B0 and B1. When we talk about the population values, it'll be beta naught and beta 1. We're going to focus primarily on those and not on that sigma squared parameter for today. All right, so you can do a little bit of algebra, and you can see that this would be equal then to y equal y hat plus E. Right, so here's our y hat, b0 plus b1 x. And then the residual is equal to y minus y hat. Okay? So up here, we can say, all right, we've got a y hat for each observation. I'm going to just draw that y hat with a square. So here's our y hat, and that's b0 plus b1 x. And so we've got y hat on the regression line. And then there's, there's our y. Right? So here's y. Here's y hat, and then the difference between them, that is our e, right? our residual, y minus y hat. So when we draw this regression line, what are we trying to do? Well, you know, if you were to just kind of plunk a line down, you're probably sort of trying to minimize how big those e's are on average, how big those discrepancies between the predicted and observed values. All right, so... For each of our data points, we can draw on the predicted value, right? And we can represent the residual as the distance between the predicted, right? So y minus y hat, the difference between the observed and the predicted value is our residual. And what we're trying to do is kind of minimize those residuals, try to pick the line that's going to maximize the correspondence between the predicted values and the observed values in some way. All right, so how do we make that into an objective criterion for choosing B0 and B1. Well, one way would be to say, all right, let's take all of our Y's minus Y hats, and let's just add them up and try to make that sum as small as possible. All right, so we're going to try to minimize the sum of those discrepancies between the observed and predicted values or residuals, right? That's just E in the middle there. Well, there's a problem with that. It seems like it makes sense, except that some residuals are positive, other residuals are negative, and they're going to tend to kind of cancel each other out, and so we're going to end up with zero in the middle there, and there's not much we can do with that. So, one option would be to say, well, you know, instead of just adding up, let's first take their absolute values, and then add them up, and minimize the sum of the absolute residuals. So then these negative residuals are going to be made positive and we'll just add them all up and we'll try to make those discrepancies as small as possible. 
And that makes a lot of sense, right? And, and visually, that's probably what we're doing if we just plunk a ruler down here and try to figure out what that best line is. So it makes a lot of sense conceptually. However, in order to obtain this minimum, we've got to do a little bit of calculus. And calculus on absolute values is somewhat challenging. And so, all right, you know, let's, let's see if we can find a simpler solution. So we statisticians tend to be somewhat lazy people, and we want easier answers than that. By the way, you, you can actually do that kind of, uh, uh, you, you can do regression modeling with minimizing the sum of the absolute values. It's just harder to do. Uh, so that does exist, and you, you can do it. But what is more commonly done is to take the square of those residuals, right? You square a negative number, you get a positive number. So for instance, if you have a negative two, you square, you get four. So like the absolute value function, it's, it solves our problem that negative and positive residuals will no longer offset one another. But unlike the absolute value function, it's very easy to do calculus on squared, uh, on the, the squared function here. And so we can do the calculus to minimize this expression and get our estimates for B0 and B1 fairly easily. Now, visually, what are we doing when we square these residuals? Is we're no longer really minimizing these discrepancies between the observed uh, and the residuals directly, right? It is we're now squaring those, and we're minimizing that square. So we can visualize that by, instead of just drawing a line to each residual, we're gonna draw a box. And that box is gonna have height and width equal to the residual value. Right, so now I put these boxes on, and what we're doing with ordinary least squares is we're effectively trying to minimize the sum of the areas of those boxes. Right, so find the regression line, find the values of B0 and B1. They're going to minimize the sizes of those boxes so that their sum across all the observations is as small as it can possibly be. Right? So that's essentially what ordinary least squares regression is doing, is it's finding out how do we minimize the sum of the squared residuals across all the observations in our sample. And there are some algebraic solutions we can work through, that we won't, but we could work through the calculus to get to those. But there are algebraic solutions for what B0 and B1 values will minimize that sum of squared residuals, so we can calculate those estimates straightforwardly. Um, so we're going to minimize that sum of squared residuals. We get our B0, we get our B1, and they minimize the, the sum to area of those boxes in the sample. And those are going to be our best ordinary least squares estimates for what beta naught and beta 1 are. Right? So remember, what we're interested in are beta naught and beta 1. What we get are the sample analogs B0 and B1. Right? B0 and B1 are going to be interpreted the same way as beta naught and beta 1. B0, again, is going to be wherever x is 0. That's our B0, and B1 is going to be, all right, the change, oops, B1 will be the change in Y per one unit change in X. So they have the same interpretation, however, now in the sample and in terms of sample predicted values. What we want to do, though, is we want to take those sample estimates, B0 and B1, and we want to make inferences about what those population parameters might actually be. So based on our sample, what can we infer about the population as a whole? And that'll be the topic of the next episode of Office Hours is on this sequence, is I'm going to go into how inference is done in the linear regression model. Before we go, though, one other thing I want to point out about ordinary least squares is notice that we are squaring these residuals, right? So what happens if we get an unusual observation, right? So let's say, we have an observation over here, right? Now we add that observation into the mix, right? Their predicted value is way up here, right? They have a very large residual. So they're a bit of an aberrant observation. That's a problem for any method of estimation, but when we use ordinary least squares, of course, we are not just looking at that distance itself, we're squaring it, right? So notice that becomes a really large square and so ordinary least squares estimation can be sensitive to aberrant observations. And it's really important to try to screen your data to identify those aberrant observations at the outset, make sure that they're not having undue influence on your estimates. Because what's going to happen, of course, is if we add that observation in the mix, the regression line is going to have to try to tilt downward to make that square smaller, right? Is it's going to try to make that square smaller to, to make that sum of squared uh, residuals small. So 
Adrenaline observations can have quite an effect in the ordinary least squares regression model. It's something we, we need to be aware of in using this estimator. But provided you don't have any, any particularly aberrant observations that are having undue influence, ordinary least squares is a really nice method of estimation. Gives us estimates of B0 and B1 based on an objective criterion that everyone sort of feels like, okay, this is fair, this is a reasonable way to go about business. And also very important is that it gives us some nice properties in terms of making inferences for beta naught and beta one. And again, that'll be the topic of the next episode. So thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.